see if there's any questions that have come up since we were here last week. Related anything that we covered or anything tangentially related. So I think I'll start each session with just a open time for questions, Jim. Yeah, so on the negative, wait a minute. The self-reinforcing system where there's an even number of linkages and you gave the example of the Arctic. I was wondering if you could give one other example sometime today. It doesn't need to be now. Just okay. um, we could map out anything. I mean, just think of anything that builds and builds and builds until you get to a bifurcation. Um, and we can easily map that out. Uh, and you'll see that it will always be an even number of inverse linkages. Um, so I will. I'll, I'll map something out <clears throat> before the end of class to show that for another example. Anything else? Um, no, but I could do that too. I mean, I, I think probably the best place to think about that would be looking at, you know, sort of negative feedback loops in our own bodies. So you could look at heat regulation um, as one. You could link that to also blood sugar levels. So, um, I think if we did that, I'd have to probably think about the elements in each one to do it, but I think we could see that they would interact in that way. Um, but they'd be linked sort of like the example of the positive feedback in the Arctic. I should mention that <clears throat> mapping out feedback loops the way it did is not an easy thing. It's really critical. You need to know the essential elements, and the most critical thing about it is you need to stay <coughs> within the system you're looking at. Oftentimes, when people do this, they bring in elements from the larger nested system, and that just makes it very, very difficult. So you've got to be very clear about the scale you're at and stay in that scale. You've got to know the elements. You have to really know the critical elements you're going to do with. You have to make sure they're all within the system you're mapping out. Anything else? All right, for other questions, I just want to do a quick review of what we went over last week um, so that if there's any questions about any of that, we can address them. Um, and I'll just do that in about five minutes. If that all makes sense to people, then you're doing very well. But I just want to you know, go through that again. <coughs> So we started last session out um, talking about and contrasting linear systems to complex systems. And the determinant about whether a system would be linear or complex is how the parts within the system interact. If they interact in a lockstep way, that would be a linear system. And that would be a very static system because everything is set in how it interacts. Um, however, if they interact in a non, in a, in a way that's not lockstep, that Parts can interact with different parts in different ways at different times based on the internal dynamics of the system, and that's complex. So just related to how the parts interact. Now I said that you know um, because systems are nested, true linear systems may not exist. It may just be a conceptual idea we have. Within that, we looked at feedback loops because within a complex system, since the parts don't interact in a lockstep way they start feeding back on each other. You get feedback loops. So we talked about negative, or maybe better termed, self-regulating feedback, which maintains the status quo of the system, keeps the pattern behavior of the system very consistent. <clears throat> and that's very common in systems that reach maturity, where they want to be on that very even keel sort of level. And then we also talk about positive feedback, more appropriately called self-reinforcing feedback, that what, what that feedback does, it takes the system and keeps pushing it away from where it currently is, pushing it and pushing it, and at some point, and this would be like the straw that breaks the camel's back, it pushes it far enough that the system flips into a whole new pattern of behavior in what is called a bifurcation event. Um, that is very appropriate in developmental systems. Systems that are developing can go through a number of bifurcations to increase their level of complexity and and uh, how they operate. So both are appropriate in the right context. Both can be very dangerous in the wrong context. And as I mentioned, uh, negative and positive are probably not good terms because it gives the idea that one's good and one's bad. They're both good in the right context. They're both problematic in the wrong context. Um, and what that gives rise to in terms of rates of change in a complex system, change, um, large scale change, is episodic. The feedback leading up to that through these self reinforcing feedback loops can be gradual and accumulative, 
But when you reach that bifurcation, the system flips. And so large scale change in complex systems happens very fast and can't be predicted exactly when it's going to happen. So um, that, that's a, a classic sort of thing based on, on bifurcation events. Um, we talked about nestedness, that everything is nested, one system within another within another. Uh, it's really important um, to be facile in scaling, moving up and down in spatial and temporal scales. Uh, scaling up gives us context for understand why a system's behaving the way it is. Uh, scaling down can give us specific intervention points, so scaling is very critical. And when we're really looking at systems, it's really critical. We know what scale we're working at because when we scale, change scales, the dynamics of feedback loops and all sorts of things changes. So we've got to be very clear on the, the scale of that. So after doing that sort of stuff and talking about complex systems, we shifted into looking at the second law of thermodynamics that states that although energy cannot be created nor destroyed, energy can be transformed from one state to another. But the critical aspect of this law is that whenever a transformation occurs within the system where that transformation is taking place, the uh, transformation can never be 100% efficient. And what that means is that whenever we transform energy, energy is being lost during the transformation from the system where that transformation is taking place. <clears throat> and that has big implications because for open systems that can take in energy and give off energy, they can be in one of three energetic states. If they take in more energy, then they bleed off in the transformations. They're called neg or anti-entropic systems. And these are systems that grow because they're storing energy. They're taking in more than they're releasing. Uh, when systems reach maturity, they become dynamic equilibrium where the amount of energy entering the system is the same as the amount being released from transformations and growth stops. And then the third state is a state where the amount of energy entering the system is less <clears throat> than it's being released from the transformations. And that's an entropic system. And because those systems are constantly losing energy through time, they move from a state of complexity towards simplicity and a state of uh, concentration of materials to diffusion. And let me give one example of this, which I think will help show this. So imagine, you know, we get a windstorm <clears throat> and maybe a large sugar maple falls over in the forest around here. It uproots and quickly dies. Now it's become an entropic system. It can no longer take in energy. But every decomposing organism that starts extracting energy from that tree, fungi, bacteria, whatever, as that energy is being extracted, the complex structure of that tree is being simplified. Its complex molecules of cellulose and lignin are being broken down to very simple molecules of carbon dioxide and water that diffuse out into the atmosphere. And um, after a number of decades, that tree will be completely gone. That will be at some tropic end. All the energy within that tree will have been released from the transformations all of its complex molecules will be broken down to simple molecules of carbon dioxide, water, nitrogen gas, simple inorganic molecules, all which diffuse into the air or diffuse into the soil. And that would be the entropic end of that tree. So entropy, a process, we're always moving from concentration to diffusion or from complexity to simplicity. Uh, so that's probably a good example of that. Now, <clears throat> the reason I was dwelling on that last week is this is the underlying reason why our current trajectory um, is not sustainable. Um, I mentioned that uh, the biosphere has been around for 3.8 billion years. For the three, first 3.5 billion years, it was an anti-entropic system. It was taking in more energy through photosynthesis than was releasing as heat from the metabolism of all its biota. And as a result, we build up a lot of biomass on this planet. The atmosphere went from zero to 21% oxygen through that process. But then around um, 300 million years ago, the biosphere became dynamic equilibrium. We know this because oxygen levels have been very stable at 21%, meaning that the amount of energy being taken in through photosynthesis pretty much equal the amount of heat released to space. But in the last one to two centuries, because of um, our species, Homo sapiens, <coughs> continuously increasing their transformations of energy on this planet, the biosphere has now become an entropic system. We're basically releasing 10% more energy as heat out in outer space than re being replaced as solar gain. And as a result, 
um, we're seeing all these various environmental issues we're dealing with, and they're all entropic issues. If we look at them, we'll see that we're looking at systems that are moving from complexity towards simplicity, or we're looking at concentrated stores of energy materials that are being diffused. And so what that means is this larger biospheric system that our socioeconomic system is nested within is being, is being degraded. And eventually, that degradation is going to get to the point where we're going to get a negative feedback loop self-regulating feedback loop in that larger system that's going to start to impact um, our abilities to do what we're currently doing. And eventually that's going to stop this whole, uh, this whole growth mode we're in. And it's not a question of if that will happen, it's just if we continue this trajectory, it's a question of when that will happen. And a lot of that could come from, you know, real dramatic impacts on infrastructure for climate change, um, you know, access to, to drinking water, uh, growing food, things such as that, will all be part of that, probably. So after that, we then ventured into looking at community ecology as a study or a branch of ecology. It looks at the interrelationships between different species in, in ecosystems. And then with that, I mapped out the various ecological symbioses. And I mentioned that uh, symbiosis, as um, defined by biologists, is a mutually beneficial interaction for both parties. Ecologists have a broader uh, view of this. It's just any interaction between two different uh, individuals of two different species um, because ecologists see these relationships as changing through time, through a process called coevolution. And that's what we're going to go into today, um, looking at how that process works. But that's sort of just a sort of a synthesis of what we covered last week. Are there any questions that comes out of that? Or any, that, or that all seem to be making sense to people. One example of four all is what? So neutralism, I don't know if we can have an example. I, I'll challenge you to think of something where two individuals are interacting, but neither is being affected at all. I fail to. Yeah, I, I, it, it just seems like then there's no interaction. Yeah, that's what I just say. That's what, that's what I say. It's, it's mostly there to round out the scheme. Yeah. Somebody's going to say, all right, zero, zero. And it, so someone, you know, wanted to round out. But it's really more like I said last week is Zen Cohen. Right. You can contemplate that as long as you want. And I don't know if you'll ever land on a definitive answer, but actually, if it actually exists or not. But in any case, these two are really not very, very important in our scheme of things. This is just accidental, and so natural selection can't really deal with uh, accidental stuff. And this may not even exist. So that's why I put this line here, is these really aren't consequential. It's these interactions up here we're look at today. Any other questions before we break from the ground? All right, so what I want to do today is I want to <clears throat> first frame the principle of self-organization and then come back to the symbioses. Um, Self-organization is a scientific principle that sort of was codified um, in the latter half of the uh, 1900s. And it was sort of one of the final pieces uh, put into the, the, the body of theory uh, surrounding complex systems. And so what self-organization is, during the anti-entropic phase, um, when, when systems are taking in more energy than they're releasing, um, they can go through a process of self-organization. And if they do, what self-organization is, is those systems are not just getting bigger as they're storing energy, they get more complex. And the complexities derive from the parts within the system, whether they're cells in an, an organism's body, species in an ecosystem, um, entities in a social system, um, the parts the complexities derive from the parts becoming ever more specialized and tightly integrated together. Such that each part is not only is doing what it needs to do to sustain itself, but creates conditions that sustain the whole. And as a result, these self-organizing systems through time grow increasingly more energy efficient, more stable, and more resilient. So I'll just go through that again. Uh, self-organization, a process that as a system is growing, it can increase its complexity. The complexity derived from the parts becoming ever more specialized and tightly integrated together, such that each part doing what it needs to do to sustain itself creates conditions that sustain the whole, and these systems grow increasingly efficient, stable, and resilient. So <clears throat> our bodies 
are all a beautiful example of self-organization. We all know this. I don't think we can really comprehend it. Um, but we all started life. It's just a single microscopic cell. And now we have these bodies that have 40 trillion cells within them. And during our developmental phases, that one cell just didn't divide and multiply to 40 trillion. It started differentiating. So now we've got 254 different cell types in our bodies. But the specialization goes even further. Some, for example, in nerve cells, some nerve cells strictly communicate with a muscle cell. Other nerve cells strictly communicate with a sensory cell. Other neurons link sensory neurons to motor neurons. Our cells are incredibly specialized. But luckily for us, they're all tightly integrated together in a way that each cell doing what it needs to do for its own purposes creates conditions that sustain the whole. And as a result, our internal bodily environment is really stable. You know, temperature right at 98.6, pH right at 6.8, blood sugar levels carefully controlled, all these things carefully controlled through self-regulating feedback loops, and we're resilient. We get injured, we heal. Um, we get sick, we heal. So that's all the result of self-organization. It's a lucky thing we didn't have to orchestrate that whole process. And it's a lucky thing we don't have to think about it because it can drive us crazy. <laughs> all right, you 40 trillion cells, this is what you're gonna do right now. This is what you're gonna do, it'd be like just anomaly complex and so luckily we just let our bodies do that and we can do whatever else we want to do but um, we can do that because we're highly self-organized so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this process of self-organization how it plays out in ecosystems through evolutionary time um, and as we're going to see how it can cause these relationships to change through time now <coughs> in the natural world um, the bottom line currency is energy. And this should be the bottom line currency in our world as well as a socioeconomic system. If we really had that as a bottom line currency, we'd do things very, very differently. But out there, energy is the currency. And it's a rock hard currency. It's not like euros or dollars that can fluctuate. A kilocalorie of energy is always a kilocalorie of energy. And there's only so much out there. It's limited. So natural selection is always pushing species toward becoming more energy efficient. Because if you're an organism or your population, you develop a behavior or a strategy or an adaptation that makes you more energy efficient, it means you'll be able to support a larger population on the same finite amount of energy. And natural selection is always culling out organisms or populations that are energy inefficient. Because they cannot support as large a population, and through time, they get overwhelmed by the energy efficient um, sort of strains of that species or organism. That has big implications because that's what is that natural selection driving for energy efficiency that can cause these relationships to co evolve and change through time. Now, generally, and uh, I think Mary Ellen was mentioning this earlier with, with the invasive you know, plants and also with the uh, Asian longhorn beetle. One reason ecologists say we should not be moving organisms from one part of the world to another part of the world is we generate what are called young ecological symbioses. We're creating relationships where the two parties have never had any chance to co-evolve and adjust their ecologies. And these are usually really nasty for the parties involved. So a very good example of a young symbiosis was the accidental introduction of the chestnut blight fungus into the New World in 1904. Now that fungus came in on oriental chestnuts being planted at the Bronx Zoo and Botanic Garden. And don't do what I did one time and sort of mention that to somebody that worked there. That was a very upsetting thing for them. But it wasn't their fault because the fungus and those old world chestnuts had co-evolved probably through millions of years. And as a result, that fungus was an incredibly mild parasite. Matter of fact, so mild that when the people were planting these trees at the Bronx Zoo and Botanic Garden, no one even knew they were infected because they didn't see any lesions or anything. But the American chestnut in this fungus had never interacted. So at the time of that introduction, 1904, the American chestnut was the most common forest tree east of the Mississippi River. Um, in the heart of its range, places like Tennessee and Kentucky, one out of every two trees was American chestnut, and they grew to immense size. We have tree-like photographs of trees up to about 14 feet in diameter. So that's about 
from the corner of that partition down to me here. You can imagine a tree of that girth. They grew to over 200 feet in height. They produced the most edible nut of any tree in North America. They're the signature tree of the temperate deciduous forest. And it only took about 30 years for that fungus to spread throughout the range of the chestnut and almost completely eradicate it. It was certainly the most devastating ecological event that the temperate deciduous forest has probably experienced in millions of years. Now, that obviously was a very bad outcome for American chestnut, but I'd like you to contemplate the fungus. If you're a host-specific fungus, the worst thing you could do is eradicate your host. Because if you do that, you've just eradicated your species. If you think about it, that was an incredibly energy-wasteful thing for that fungus to do, to kill off its host trees like that. It would have been much better served if it didn't kill the host trees. It would have lived longer. It would have reproduced more. There would have been more of a resource for its offspring. It did the absolutely worst thing it could do and most energy inefficient thing you could do. And that's why ecologists say we shouldn't be moving species around the globe as we create these young symbioses that are, that are not very good and actually can be very, very, very bad. Um, now, in island contexts where you have smaller populations, those young symbioses can often cause extinctions. But when you get in a large continental context like North America, it's much rarer for these things to create extinction events. So I'm quite confident that all of our trees currently suffering pathogens, and trees maybe suffering future pathogens, all of our invasive plants, all these things eventually are going to work them at themselves out. Because if we don't get extinction, and I don't think we will, natural selection is going to kick into gear and force the species to adjust their ecologies to become more energy efficient. Um, and I'm confident that will happen to Chestnut because in the summer of 2012, uh, with graduate students from Antioch University of New England, we were able to identify two populations of American chestnuts that are resistant in reproducing. Uh, both, both populations were on the eastern flanks of Mount Everett in the southwestern part of the state of Massachusetts. Uh, both had probably um, about six to seven dozen individuals that were of reproductive age. For American chestnut to make viable nuts, they have to cross-pollinate. If they self-pollinate, they make the chestnut burr, but the nuts are not viable. Well, these trees were cross-pollinating, and there were seedlings and saplings throughout the understory. So this is, there's two stands out there, each probably about 30 acres in size, that are reproducing. Now, you would guess that whatever resistance these chestnuts have, they can, what they can do is they can encapsulate the fungus and keep it from girdling them. But eventually they get up to about 14, 16 inches in diameter, they do succumb. But they've had probably a good, you know, 40 years of reproduction time before that happens. So you can imagine their offspring probably have a little bit more resistance. And maybe they'll make it to two feet in diameter. And then their offspring should have even more resistance. And after a number of generations, we should have very resistant chestnuts that would start expanding out their range again. Um, we know this happened with, um, with our, our eastern hemlock. Uh, 5,000 years ago, eastern hemlock was covering its current range that we find in North America today. It was very prevalent. We have lots of pollen records. And for 1,000 years in North America, eastern hemlock pollen completely disappears. We can't find any pollen anywhere. And then 4,000 years ago, it starts becoming apparent again and builds back up. So probably something happened to the, in the hemlock that almost knocked it out. But coevolution kicked in, forced the species to adjust their ecologies to become more energy efficient. And whenever this happens, it causes these relationships to become more and more beneficial. Now, I should mention, with the American chestnut, we have what is called a very strong selection pressure. selection pressures whenever a sizable proportion of a population is killed off. Um, so the, 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 the greater the proportion of the population is killed off, the faster that population is going to respond to that young interaction. So let me give an example of this. Um, in the 1860s, an expatriate 
Britt, who was living in Australia, running a sheep ranch down there, decided he wanted to hunt European rabbits. So he had his brother ship down 24 European rabbits, obviously hunting wallabies or kangaroos or whatever the creatures are down there just didn't make it. He wanted to rabbit hunt. Now, um, European rabbits had been brought into Australia before this time to be raised as meat animals. But he didn't want to raise them as meat animals. He just wanted to release them on his ranch so he could hunt them. So by 1872, um, during a time of year when there's not much going on in the sheep ranches, he invited all the regional ranches over his farm to hunt rabbits. And they hunted for a full week, and the kill was around 10,000 rabbits. And of course, we started 24, and that's because rabbits are known, you know, have the ability to reproduce pretty dramatically. Um, by 1900, the rabbit population was now in the hundreds of millions. And this was having big impacts on the sheep ranchers because eight rabbits were consuming as much forage and water as one sheep. So the productivity of their sheep farms was really being impacted. So the Australian government did two things. One, they made ammunition free for anyone that wanted to hunt rabbits. They also had a one penny bounty on every rabbit tail brought in. And then they did sort of a curious thing. They built a fence right across Australia, 1,500 mile long fence dividing the continent in half, trying to keep the rabbits on one side. But rabbits are also known for another attribute besides reproductive capacity. And what's that? They burrow. They just burrow right over the fence. Millions of dollars went in this fence. It was, just, it was just like for useless. Right away, the rabbits just burrowed underneath. Well, this continued to be a problem until 1950. And in 1950, someone came up with this idea. He said, you know, our New World rabbits have this virus called myxoma. And in our New World rabbits, like cottontails, if they get exposed to myxoma virus, it's like getting the flu. They'll get a bit of a fever. They'll be a little bit more lethargic. It lasts for a few days. Then they recover. So it's a very mild sort of parasitism. But European rabbits have never been exposed to myxoma. They've never co-evolved with it. And myxoma is host-specific to rabbits. It doesn't affect any other mammals. So someone said, you know, if we could get myxoma virus over here in Australia, um, we could solve this problem. It would infect all these European rabbits, kill them off, and um, we'd be in easy street. And because, yes, generally if, if European rabbits are exposed to myxoma virus, it's lethal within 24 hours. So what they did was they built a bunch of breeding, mosquito breeding facilities around Australia. <laughs> And they bred mosquitoes, these are native mosquitoes, in myxoma-rich environments. So the mosquitoes had a lot of the virus in them. They released them, and within months, there were dead rabbits everywhere. Matter of fact, it's estimated that the mortality rate was 99.99%. And that is what a really strong selection pressure is. When you take that much out of the population, you really reduced it dramatically. It's a very strong selection pressure. Now, is that the end of the story, do you think? No. no. Like, why is that not the end of the story? Oh, yes. It's this, this, it's this right here. This is significant. <laughs> Thousands of rabbits didn't die. And they didn't die for one of three reasons. So let's see if you can guess some. Why, why might they not have died? They're Isolation. OK, they never got the virus. That's, that's one reason. How about another? They were resistant. They were resistant. Their genetics made it so that the virus is not lethal. There's a third one that's harder to get. They never got bitten by a mosquito. Well, that would be the first one. They never they got. Survived. They never got the virus. They survived. They survived it because one reason is because they were their genetics was such it wasn't lethal. But there's another reason that they could have been exposed to it and survived it that had nothing to do with that. The, the virus could have mutated into a non-virulent form. So those are those are the different reasons. Now, in this case. This was a really nasty young symbiosis, so much so that the myxoma virus went extinct in Australia. It died out. But this 0.1% of rabbits um, started breeding, and probably a lot of them had resistance. And now, all of a sudden, you're getting a resistant population. So by 1960, we're back up to lots of rabbits, and they said, hey, no problem. We got those mosquito breeding facilities. We'll just, you know, do the thing again. They did it. But this time, only 90% mortality. And this time, the virus did not go extinct. And today, this has co-evolved the point where it's less than 10% lethal for 
for rabbits exposed to this virus. So what's happened in basically the span of half a century, we went from a very serious predation driven by energy efficiency more towards parasitism. And that's co-evolution happening because of very strong selection pressure. Now around here, we can see the same thing happening with white uh, nose syndrome in bats. Um, I remember that first came in. We, we, have, um, we used to have bats that would roost underneath the siding of our house. We had a deck. And I knew how, exactly how many bats I had. There was, I could see their guano piles on the deck. <laughs> and you know, we used to consistently have about five bats on that one side of the house. Um, then white nose syndrome came in, and all of a sudden bats were gone for a number of years. Well, uh, last year, before we moved across the river, we were back up to four bats there. So that's because white nose syndrome was a really strong selection pressure. It took out the bulk of the bats, but the ones that survived are the ones that had some sort of resistance, and they're the ones that build up the new resistant population. Um, and what this means is, this is important for us to know, um, if we're ever going to try to <coughs> eradicate an organism, like a microbe that's a disease, or maybe you know a, a pathogenetic insect or something, we'd better get them all. You have to get them all, because you don't, what you've done, you, you've entered into an arms race where they're gonna outrace you, because they're small, they re reproduce much more quickly, they develop strategies much faster. So we've really missed the boat here with bacteria. We have tried to really knock out bacteria. And what have bacteria done? They've developed all the adaptations to our, to our various antibiotics. So now we have so many strains that we can't touch with antibiotics. And we did that. It would have been much better if we had a strategy to try to keep their populations maybe suppressed so they weren't dangerous, but not try to knock them out. Um, and if evolutionary ecologists were at play when decisions like this were being made, they would have made a case that, no, this is the wrong way to go. We're going to pay for this in the long run. Um, but in any case, driven by energy efficiency, we can have relationships, young symbioses that start off as predation, can co-evolve to parasitism, then through time can go co-evolve to commensalism, um, then to maybe proto-cooperation and right up to mutualism. So through co-evolution driven by energy efficiency, we can start off with parasitism and move right up to mutualism, where both parties not only benefit from interacting, but they have to interact for their survivorship. So my favorite example of this involves the uh, bullshorn acacia tree and its resident Azteca acacia ant. These are two species that live in southern Mexico down through Central America. Um, through their co-evolved time together, uh, the acacias developed three features to serve as its ants. The first is the thorns that used to ward off the mouths of munching animals have now grown huge and pliable and swollen, so they don't protect the trees anymore. But what the ants do is they hollow them out, and that's where they raise their young. So now they've got lodging on the tree. Secondly, every leaf stem has open neck areas, or these are also called sap wells, where the sap just comes right up to the surface. The ants go there to drink, that's where they get their water and also their carbohydrate energy resource. And then thirdly, around the margin of every leaflet are these little globules called Belgian bodies, which are loaded with proteins and lipids. And the ants harvest those and eat them, and that gives them their nutrition, and then they grow back, almost like you know, what other fruit coming back. You know, um, If you remove acacia ants from an acacia tree, they'll be dead in 24 hours. They're so highly co-evolved, they can only survive on acacia sap and Belgian bodies. But in return, they give their host trees the most advanced plant defense system of any tree in the world. They have incredibly venomous stings that will just ward off all herbivores, so nothing ever munches in those trees. But not only that, if vines try to crawl up the trunk of the tree, the ants will come down, they'll chop through those vines and kill them. If surrounding trees attempt to encroach in the case of space, the ants will go over to those trees and defoliate them. Um, if you remove acacia ants from their host tree by, let's say, using you know, insecticides, that tree will be defoliated and dead within about a month's time. Because it's now co-evolved to the point where it has to rely on its ants. So this is a mutualism where both parties benefit from the interaction. They have to interact to survive. But we know from the genetics and the mandibular structure of these ants that they're derived from leaf cutter ants. So way back when, when there was a young symbiosis, when the, that ancestral leaf cutter ant 
in that a successful acacia first came into contact as a young symbiotic relationship, it was probably not a very pretty picture. Trees may have been being stripped of their leaves and defoliated, possibly being killed. And of course, that was a very energy wasteful thing. And somehow, natural selection kicked into gear, driven by energy efficiency, and started forcing these species to adjust their ecologies, to become more energy efficient. And somehow, it moved from possibly predation or very serious parasitism right up to mutualism. And we don't know the route it took. We just know that it got there. Um, this is such a potent force, this process of coevolution, um, that we've had five major extinction events on this planet where uh, fossil evidence suggests we've lost more than 90% of all the biota in each of those events. Within about 10 to 15 million years, through um, this process of coevolution, um, basically the species risk of the planet has not just gotten back to where it was before each extinction event, it surpassed it each time. Because natural selection driven by energy efficiency is always causing these species to co-evolve. And what that means is, as we're gonna see, through time, they become more and more and more specialized and more and more tightly integrated into their ecosystems. So this is, is self-organization happening at the evolutionary time frame in ecosystems, being driven by, by energy efficiency. So any questions about any of that? I have a question. I don't know whether this is the appropriate time to address it. My, my question is, uh, to what extent can you apply this type of analysis to uh, social systems? And, and, so, and so what are the yeah. constraints on that? Yeah, we will get in there. There's really not constraints. That is the beauty about complex system science, is that these principles apply to any complex system. You know, So that means we can be completely transdisciplinary. We can move from one system to another. Um, is These things apply in all the systems. Feedback loops, emergent properties, bifurcation events, self-organization, they're all there. And that's why this stuff was codified with all these different researchers and all these different disciplines saying, wow, the same things are happening in our disciplines, that's because they're complex. So it, it, that's the beauty of it. You can now use it and apply it directly. We'll get into seeing how we can do that in human systems, um, you know, before the end of the last class. I'm curious, you know, like, um, thinking about like wolves and wolves really, you know, like what we call predators, um, and I know in you know, more stable systems, they're actually helping balance things. So is there a way in which what we label as predators are actually get to a mutualism? Yeah. Uh, now, don't forget, symbioses are described as one-on-one -on -one encounters uh -huh. between two individuals. Okay. That's how they're always defined. Uh -huh. But if we scale up and now look at population dynamics, predation can be a very beneficial force for prey population. Um, so, you know, and, and that makes sense, but, you know, if we're to look at one-on-one, -on -one, that moose that gets taken down by the wolf, it's, it's going to get eaten. So it's, it's definitely a, a plus minus, but at the population level, it's a different dynamic. So again, just the way that symbioses are defined. Now, um, and you'll see the same thing happening again, driven by energy efficiency, if these, even these negative relationships, parasitism, predation and stuff, can work at the population to benefit the populations of the groups. So it, it can, and it does. And it only makes sense, I mean, you know, if we want really to think about how you get sustainable systems, it's not gonna be one where things are just eating each other and killing each other and not being benefits from that, or places where just everything competes. It's just not gonna work. I mean, you wanna have a really good, sustainable, you know, family in terms of the in relationships. It's not like you say, all right, it's dinner time, you guys compete for your dinner. Whoever gets the most wins. You know, we just don't do that. Um, and the notion that somehow that's gonna make really helpful systems is really sort of misguided. What's making them are this myriad of integrated interrelationships that are mutually beneficial and support the whole system. Any other questions or comments on this? All right, so um, let me show how um, this can happen, this, this sort of driving towards greater specialization uh, through co-evolution by just looking at competition. Let's just look at competition. I said, in the natural world, competition occurs because resources are limited. Generally, populations produce more 
offspring that can be supported. So there's always going to be competition because there's always going to be um, resource limitations. If we had situations where resources were not limited, we probably wouldn't see competition. But because there, there is limitations, competition occurs. But natural selection via coevolution is going to force species to move away from their competitive overlaps because they can get an energy boost in that process. And this happens through what is called niche separation. All right, niche separation. So what, what a niche is, it's an organism's ecological role. Um, and we could never define the niche for any organism. It's way, way too complex. It involves all their interactions with the biotic world, all their interactions with the abiotic world, all their adaptations, all their behaviors. Their totality of everything they do is part of their niche. And that's why it's really hard to pin down the niche of an organism. So what ecologists do is they look at subsets of the niche. They might look at the foraging niche. All right, how does this bird species go about finding its food? And we can get a better handle on that. So when two species are involved, or two individuals of different species are involved in competitive interactions, they're using energy in those competitive interactions. If they can figure out a strategy to avoid the competition and coexist, they get an energy boost. And this is driven, again, by coevolution. So let's think of, let's think of like the foraging niche of two species going after the same food, the same ecosystem. How could they separate their niches so that they could avoid competing? Well, not hatch and a chickadee. All right, so that's a good example of white breasted not hatch, black cap chickadee. So they both are eating seeds. One might be eating seeds from another spot on the tree. Okay, seed eating is relatively recent for them. They're mostly insect eaters okay. historically, mm -hmm. but you're right. They forage on different parts of the tree. This is what is called microhabitat separation. So a habitat is the ecosystem in which an organism resides, or a constellation of ecosystems. If you're a bear, your habitat's going to be wetlands and uplands and you know barrens and all sorts of stuff. But let's say if you're a red squirrel, your habitat might just be um, the coniferous forest, the place where they, they exist. Now red squirrels use their whole habitat. You can see them right up in the very canopy. You can see them burrowing underground. They can be everywhere in between. And they seem to be the exception to the rule about energy efficiency. I don't understand them. They just run around <laughs> crazy all the time. It's like, this makes no sense. You don't need to do that. Just calm down. And just, you know, I, I don't know how they do it. Because they really, they seem to defy this whole notion of energy efficiency. But, but some organisms have microhabitats. And that's what's going on with chickadees and nuthatches. So chickadees through time have co-evolved to just specialize in foraging on branches, nuthatches on the trunks of trees. And in this way, they can eat the same type of insects but not compete at all. They can coexist without competition, and through that, get an energy boost. So that's one way this can happen. How else can two species um, that maybe use the same even microhabitat, eat the same food, how could they separate their niches in the, in the same ecosystem? Time Yeah, so this would be temporal separation. Time of day, time of season, um, all sorts of things. So. We can have, you know, owls active at night, hawks active in the day. They don't compete because they're active at different times. And of course, this can even happen in the plant world. So it's hard to imagine right now that, you know, within a little, you know, more than two months, um, near the end of April, we can go out to our calcium rich woodlands around here. And if we go into one of those woodlands long before the canopy leaves have leafed out, the ground is going to be carpeted. It'll be from leaves of wild leeks, uh, Dutchman's breeches, squirrel corn, trout lilies, spring beauties. All five of those vernal wildflowers are ephemerals. They do all of their photosynthesis between early April and early May. That's when they do it all. And then the canopy leaves come on, they die back down below ground level, and a new cohort of plants grows up, the blue cohosh and Virginia waterleaf and the baneberry and all these other plants. In this way, we have these two groups of plants that coexist and they do not compete for energy at all because they've temporally separated their niches um, in that way. So that's another way this can happen. How about, let's say, the two species are active in the same microhabitat, eating the same food at the same time in the 
the same place, how could they separate their niches? They could share the food parts? Uh, you're getting close. Exactly. They, they develop a preference. What it's called is resource partitioning. And a great example of this are Darwin's finches. So we get these mixed foraging flocks of different species of finch down in the Galapagos. The small beak finch just eats small seeds. The large beak finch just eats large seeds. And in this way, they can coexist without energy losses from competition. But through all these things, what you're going to notice is this is going to cause species to specialize. They're going to move away from more generalized foraging strategies to more and more specialized foraging strategies. And what does that mean about the size of their ecological niche? It's going to shrink. It's going to get smaller. So self-organization, working via co-evolution, causes species driven by energy efficiency to specialize. Their niches get smaller. And what does that mean about the number of species that an ecosystem can support? More. As niches get smaller, a system can support more species. And you start boosting up more and more species, more and more complexity, more and more integration, making these systems increasingly resilient and stable. So let's look at another example. Now I want to get into using predation as an example of how co-evolution drives it to become, um, drives species to become more specialized. I'm going to look this through uh, what are called color schemes. Right, so organisms, if they're involved in predator-prey relationships, will often color themselves to hide if they are prey or to hide if they're ambush predators. So they're not as visible to the prey. So can anyone think of a coloration scheme that animals employ to do this? What's that? Butterfly. Well, you have to be more specific. Yes. Monarch and viceroy. Okay. So the old idea was that viceroys were mimic mimicking monarchs because monarchs, because they eat um, uh, milkweeds, uh, are very distasteful. That was an ecological myth that was basically disproved about 20 years ago. What we now know is that viceroys are equally as distasteful as monarchs. <laughs> so what they're doing is we have mimicry here. This is what's called, this is called Mullerian mimicry. Malarian mimicry is when a number of different organisms look like each other because they're either dangerous or distasteful. And it just makes it easier for predators to learn that. So another group of malarian mimics would be bees, hornets, wasps. They all have a yellow and black banded abdomen. Uh, and that's just to make it easier for things to know, oh yeah, that's dangerous. Um, I remember that. Those are all malarian mimics. So that's one way to do it. But there is a, two other types of mimicry. There's Batesian mimicry. And this is where one species is not dangerous or distasteful and is mimicking something that is. So a real good example of that around here are our, our, our hoverflies. Um, out in the summertime, you may have seen these. These are little flies that hover, often attracted to people because they will pick off things like gnats and black flies that come to us. Um, and people look at them and they freak out. Most people see them, they'll run away because they have a yellow and black banded abdomen. But they're not a bee, horn, or wasp. They're a fly. They're not dangerous at all, but they look like they are. Now, when you're a bait scene mimic, it means you have to be very rare compared to what you're mimicking. Because if you're pretty common, predators can get very confused. They're not going to get the message. But uh, if you're fairly rare or uncommon, then it works. And I've often thought, gee, what a great idea it would be to get you know, a hoverfly and maybe a horse hair and with some super glue, tape one end on the fly and then one end on the hat. And then during black flies, you can just have this thing right with you all the time. The black <laughs> I've never done it, just a thought. <laughs> and then finally, there's a last type of mimicry called structural. And this is when the organism is mimicking something it is not at all. Uh, 
Um, so a walking stick, looking like a twig. A leaf hopper, looking like a thorn. Um, there are some you know, beautiful moths when they fold up their wings, they look just like a leaf on a twig. With a mid vein and everything else. One of the most amazing ones I've ever seen is a tropical praying mantis that looks like an orchid. It goes out the end of a twig, it's, per it's a pink and white, it lets out its big legs, and looks just like this gorgeous flower. Of course, the insects just fly right in and poop. <laughs> so, so that would be structural mimicry. Again, when you're looking like something you're not even close to, and confusing your predator or prey in regards to that. So mimicry is one way to do this. How about another type of coloration scheme? Uh, is there some type of self-mimicry where monarchs don't bother to use the milkweeds? I haven't heard that. I, you know, I haven't heard that, that, that monarchs don't eat milkweeds. Some of them don't, and they're good protect. I guess it's a subset of... It would be, and that would be like a Batesian, yeah. So they're, they have a different host plant. Huh, I didn't realize that. But that would be like Batesian. The little spiders that sit in plants, the same color, orange and yellow. Okay, so um, this would be what's called um, uh, cryptic coloration. Yeah. When your color matches the background color of the environment that you're in. So, you know, our white-tailed deer are cryptically color colored. In the wintertime, when we have a snowpack, their pelage is gray, looking like the color of trunks of trees. When they're out in the woods, they sort of blend in with that background of tree trunks. And yet, in the summer, they turn more of a brownish color. Um, you know, grasshoppers that are green on green grass, leafhoppers that are green on green leaves. Uh, anytime you have a color that matches your background, you're using cryptic coloration. And a lot of organisms can change this um, through time. So chameleons can change it. Uh, you know, uh, squids and cuttlefish can change it, as can octopus or octopi. Uh, certainly around here, our snowshoe hare and our, our, you know, ermine can change their color to match the snow in the winter and then match the leaf uh, colored understory in the summer. So cryptic coloration, when your color matches the background you exist on. Now, if you add on another one, another coloration scheme to this, you get camouflage. So what you have to add on to being the right color to get camouflage. You have, to, you have to change the pattern on you. And this is called what's called disruptive coloration. So this is usually banding, stripes, speckling, spotting, uh, all things to break up your pattern. That's the whole idea of disruptive coloration is disrupt the pattern of the organism. So fawns with their dappled you know, white spots are supposed to break up the form of that fawn. It's on the ground looking like leaf litter in terms of color, because it's cryptically colored, but then the speckling makes it so the form sort of disappears. And when you put these two together, you have camouflage, when you have both cryptic and disruptive. Um, what are zebras? Do they have camouflage? What's that? They just have the disruptive color. They're just the disruptive, that's right. Because the, the, the savannah they current is not uh, black and white striped. Um, so why does that work for them if they just solely have the disruptive? Because they live in herds. They move in herds. And for predators to be effective, they've got to really focus on individuals. So when you get a charging herd of zebras that are all intermixed, it's very hard to tell where one stops and one ends, which makes <laughs> it much more difficult for predators to single out an individual. Um, but again, when you combine these things, you get uh, camouflage. And sometimes you can add on even a th another thing that even makes it even more impressive. Uh, and this is what's called flash coloration. And this occurs when an organism will flash some sort of color to mess up the search image of the predator. So this is what white-tailed deer do with their white tail. You know, many people think, oh, that's to warn all the other deer that there's a human present. The deer all know that you're there. They don't, they don't have to be warned. That is to mess up your mind. So when they're moving away from you, they're taking that big white tail and just flopping it back and forth like this. You can say as much as you want. They're not going to fool me. I'm not going to be fooled by that white tail. When they put it down, I'm going to see them. They go off in the woods. That tail goes down, and boom. It's like, where did they go? Because they've already restructured your whole search image, and you lose them. Uh, one of my favorites that I used to drive our cat 
crazy, were band-winged grasshoppers around here. You often find them on rock outcrops, is they are lichen eaters. They're beautifully, cryptically colored, look like lichen. They're all speckled and spotted, so they're really disruptive. But they have these bright yellow underwings. And so when they fly, there's this bright flash of yellow, and they land on the rock, and they hop like 90 degrees one way, the wings fold up, and it's just like they blended right in the rock. And our cat would be like bonkers. It'd go like the place it landed, and it wouldn't be there. It'd be like just so upset by that. Um, but in any case, wonderful. And these guys, they will click when they fly. And that's intentional, too. They want you to look right at them. Because our color sensors and our eyes are in the center of our eyes, not peripheral. They don't want us to see them peripherally. So when they fly, they click, 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 click. You look right at them, and they've got you. They've messed up your search image. And that works very, very nicely. Yeah? Now, how about hummingbirds that um, change their... OK, well, that's different. This is, this is a sexual selection feature. That is to attract females. So that has nothing to do with any of this. So this is all to hide from prey or to hide from predators. Um, in, an, in sexual selection is often counter to this. Males, generally, if you're looking at birds, are gaudily colored. And because of that, are much more liable to predation. They can't hide. But the desire to, to procreate so strong, it overwhelms um, sort of energy efficiency to make, you know, things uh, high. So that's a different sort of selection. What about poison frogs? Poison frogs, all right. So poison frogs are generally going to have warning coloration. And warning coloration is usually bold colors of yellow, orange, or red, often banded with black. Sometimes just the solid color. But again, really bold, so they're really noticeable. Um, so basically, you know, black in uh, yellow banding on the abdomens of uh, bees is warning coloration because it really pick it up. Same thing with the orange and black of the monarch and the viceroy. If you're nocturnal, what are the colors going to be for warning coloration if you're active at night? Black and white. So that's what a skunk has, that nice white stripe down the back and then the black on the side because you can't see color at night so you got to do black and white. But again, warning generally Bold colors during the day, usually orange, red, yellow, with black band, usually. Um, and at night, black and white to make that visible. Any other coloration schemes people can think of? Tigers. What's that? Tigers. OK, so tigers would be back up to our disruptive. Yeah. So they're you know off in you know woodland settings, generally, where you have dappled light and that that you know, banding pattern breaks up their form, making it harder for them to see because they are an ambush predator. So that's why you have that, that coloration scheme. How about um, sea ducks or marine mammals or things like that? What, what are their coloration schemes? White belly, black. Belly. Yeah, so this is what's called counter coloration. So the back, dorsal side being dark ventral side being light. So if, let's say you're a sea duck on the water and a predator is coming overhead, they look down and the dark back blends in with the dark surface of the water. But if you're underneath looking up as a predator, the white belly blends in with the light surface of the water. So this is called counter coloration and sort of protects them. So, I mean, we could go on. There's other things we talk about. But this gives you a good idea of the sort of array of strategies used by predator or prey to hide from each other. and um, but what it means is, once you take on one of these coloration schemes, you become really restricted in what you can do. If you're a green leaf hopper, you better not be sitting on a brown twig. You'll stick right out. You better stay on a leaf. If you are a twig, uh, a leaf hopper that looks like a thorn, you better always be on twigs because if you're not, you're going to be out of place. So what it means is, it really restricts how you behave where you can be, which means. It really restricts your niche, which means you become much more specialized. So again, all these co-evolved interactions are driving for specialization, which then means that species niches are getting smaller, which means through time, ecosystems can host more and more and more species and build up 
that robust network of mutually beneficial interactions which creates the resiliency and stability. Um, so any questions on this before I do one last piece I'm going to have in the field. Um, and then next week we'll start looking at, uh, at these um, still in a, in a natural context, but starting to move in how we can apply this principle of self-organization to human systems to see what that looks like. Any questions on this before you ask last thing? No. How do these uh, individuals know that they're protected from the colonies? A good question. I don't know. I haven't asked them, but they, they better have means of defining that I'm in the right place to do what I'm doing, because otherwise they will not make it. So natural selection is somehow given them the adaptive awareness to know where they have to be and how they have to behave to make this work. Because if they're not, you know, doing that correctly, they're going to get picked right out. And they do. They stand right out if they're in the wrong context. So um, that's so part if, of If the, they're in the wrong context, do they tend to exhibit some kind of awareness and, and move on? Probably if they're in the wrong context, they're not aware of what's going on, and they're going to get predated, and they're going to be gone. And then they're just taken out. So natural selection is always going to select for organisms that once they take on these schemes are doing the right thing in the right context with the right background because if they're not they're not going to make it. Well, you mentioned that some mammals are black from the top and white from the bottom. Yes, like is you that accidental or is that the nature has made the color so they would be safe but but yeah yeah, that, no, that was selected for, and these are mostly marine mammals that are like in, you know, like the ocean environments where if they are that dark on top, they match the dark ocean surface from things up above, but if they're light underneath, they match the surface. Uh, the coloring is because the, they generated the color to be safe from predators? Yeah, but they didn't do it. It's more or less... They should? Yeah, so the way this works is our best understanding at this point, this is liable to change, but our best understanding is at this point, all right, so natural selection is always gearing for selecting, you know, strategies that work or don't work. So let's just say by chance mutation, you're an individual that develops a color scheme that makes it harder to be seen. That's just a chance mutation. Well, that's probably going to get selected for because it means you're going to live longer, you may reproduce more, your offspring are going to have it, and in time, that mutated form will displace the old ancestral form because it's more fit to the environment. So it's not like the organism saying, ah, golly, I've got to come up with my greatest coloration scheme. I'm going to do this. It's not like that. It's more or less it happens. If it works, it gets maintained. If it doesn't work, it gets called out. Yeah? Doesn't the, when you talk about more specialization and narrower or narrower niches, doesn't that uh, lead to more vulnerability then? Because the disruption in the system would... It can. It can lead to more vulnerability. So we'll see when you get large-scale new disturbance happening, like what humans are doing, it's the specialized organisms that are really having trouble. They're the ones that are going extinct. The generalists are doing fine. Um, but again, from a coevolutionary strategy, the movement's always this way. It's always going to be moving this way because from the system perspective, the system's getting better and better and better. Because what you're getting is an incredible amount of repetition of function through this. And that's where the resiliency and stability come in. So maybe I, maybe I should map that out. So um, let me just map it out like this. So we start with energy efficiency, which is driving Co-evolution. The result of this is that species become specialized through time. They become more and more specialized, which means that niches shrink. Which means that species richness goes up in ecosystems, which means repetition of function goes up. Now that might not sound very good. We think repetition is, um, from a human context, often inefficient. But this is the secret to resiliency in these systems. Um, Every major functional role we have out here 
we don't just have a dozen species doing it. We've got hundreds to thousands. So if we want to catalog all the insect pollinators we have out, let's say, in a meadow around here through the whole pollination system, we come up with well over a thousand. Each species working at different time of season, different time of day, pollinating in a slightly different way. They can all coexist without competition because they've all specialized in these different ways. So if we lose any one pollinator, our system is fine because we've got 999 plus more still out there all doing the same role. Same thing with decomposition. Same thing with mycorrhizal fungi. All our critical functional roles have so many players boosted by this process. So yes, it may put individual species at risk if they specialize, but the system becomes more and more and more robust. And as a, re uh, as a result, more resilient and more stable. So don't forget, this co-evolutionary process is happening at the ecosystem level. That's the system that is self-organizing. And yes, individual species may be threatened if conditions change because of their specialization, but that's not what's driving it. The system is being driven, the ecosystem, by this process of co-evolution. Now, what I've done here is just shown that repetition, but the other side of this is not cast in this diagram, is the integration. That is critical. We don't just want to have great diversity of species. They need to be integrated in ways where they support each other. Um, so as you know, a person that's interested in forests, I love going to arboretums. I love going down to the Arnold Arboretum in Boston to see all these different species of exotic trees. But when I'm there, I'm looking at a mixture. I'm just looking at a mixture of stuff that has no integrated relationships. Those trees haven't co-evolved. There's nothing going on there. We go out into our forest where maybe you only have a dozen species of trees present. The integrated network of their interactions is so much more robust than's happening with all those trees in the Arnold Arboretum is they've all co-evolved in integrated ways. So it's not just with the species richness and repetition of function. We want it also to be really tightly integrated with a myriad of interrelationships that build up this system that is robust because of all these beneficial interactions that are taking place. And that's what gives rise to all this resiliency and stability. Now, um, from a human perspective, this is a great example of looking at self-organization in ecosystems that offers such a wonderful model. If we really want sustainable systems, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, life has thrived on this planet for 3.8 billion years. I said last week that would be a stack of paper over three miles in height, each sheet, the thickness of each sheet representing a century. The very foundation of that is because life self-organizes. That's what's given rise to that incredible stability, resiliency, and sustainability. And it's, it's a model that's really important for us to understand and start thinking about how that can come into play in our, our human systems. Yeah. So with, um, with honeybees now in danger as one of the primary pollinators of agricultural crops, or crops is that we've lost the repetition of function there. And oh, then, yeah. I mean, at one point, there were many, 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 many more types of pollinators, and yep. we just bred them to be like the sole pollinator of some of these crops. Yep. Exactly. So what self-organization does in this context is it's always moving towards decentralization of functional roles. Through all that repetition of function, we're getting decentralization. We have many, many more players with the same role. Whenever we move away from that towards concentration, we're moving away from self-organization, we're moving away from resiliency, we're moving away from stability. So honeybee is the perfect example. In the Central Valley of California, where the bulk of the produce is grown in this country, pesticide use has eliminated all native pollinators. We are down to just one pollinator. Now that is nuts. If anything happens to that pollinator, that system collapses overnight because we've lost all repetition. Uh, Detroit, another example, you know, um, you know, as of 1980, something like 90% of the jobs in Detroit were all related to General Motors. An incredible concentration of function in that one job market. And General Motors starts to falter. What happens? Detroit loses half the human population, goes bankrupt, and is left in shambles. So again, this is really important stuff to understand because this repetition of function your decentralization builds up all that resiliency and stability. Whenever we move away from that towards concentration, the more concentrated we get, the more fragile the system becomes. Um, so it's a
a really critical thing, yeah. When niches expand during a food shortage the way it happened in Darwin's finches, <coughs> does that disrupt this or does that add resilience? It, it probably is working against it, but you know, over time, it's constantly moving this way. It's like a river that's flowing downhill. We'll get eddies that you know, there'll be times that are working against it and stuff, but this is the general trajectory. Um, and you're right, whenever things change, like one thing that also happens when we talk about exotic species, in their home territories, they've co-evolved with all their biota and they've specialized within that. You bring them out of that environment to a brand new environment where they don't have any co-evolved strategies, their niches expand and they change the way they behave um, in ways that's not necessarily productive for them at all. Um, so yeah, when you get niche expansion, you're moving away from this, but the general trajectory is for, you know, uh, natural selection to be pushing towards um, this process. You haven't used the word redundancy. Um, it's sort of implied all over. Well, I'm using repetition. <laughs> Redundance has, I think, even a worse con connotation than repetition. So I like to use repetition more than redundant, but it's the same thing. It is redundant. Your diagram right there, I was trying to redraw it in my mind so that it would be a self-reinforcing system uh -huh. and an even number of linkages. And it seems like you just barely tweak it and then all of a sudden... <laughs> well, it's, it's not really like that because it's more of a flow. So it's, yeah. not, it's, not, it's not a loop. It's not a feedback loop. This is a flow. You know, we start with, you know, young ecosystems not having many species. Through time, they're accruing more and more and more and more and more. And they'll keep doing that up to a point we don't know if there's an equilibrium point or not, but usually something happens. Like there's a disturbance or something really changes the game and we're knocked back down to you know an, an, a, an earlier sort of simpler stage and then the process goes again. So it's, it's more like a, a flow, almost like an energy flow. It's not looping back on itself. It's just moving in that direction. So that's why it can't really be a loop. Yeah, do you feel that there is an equal, I mean, maybe you don't know, but do you feel that there is an equilibrium point to this process? I, I don't know. My, my gut reaction would probably say there's probably some point at which you just can't add more species because the energy is maybe getting divided into <coughs> two small mm -hmm. units. I don't know. That's just a gut level reaction. Um, and I don't know if there's any, been any empirical research that can, can answer that question. I guess the second question is, is it self-reinforcing in the sense of if there is a greater diversity of species, is there potentially a greater, you know, an expanded food supply which could then further support the creation of, or at least the sustenance of these species? There wouldn't be an expanded energy supply because the energy is going to be limited by how much is being captured by the system, oh, but it is, sure. it is decentralizing it and putting it into a lot of different forms that maybe means, yes, now you can have specialists that just specialize on this form of mm -hmm. organism, you know, so that that definitely be a play. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm concerned, uh, puzzling over state. So is, is there an overriding theory that change changes in that? inevitable, and so nothing is ever stable. Yeah, and, and stable is you no know, relative. I mean, it's moving towards greater stability. So if you have ecosystems with not many species, there's a lot of perturbations in the system. So you can get like, on a regular basis all sorts of perturbations, but you don't have you know, a lot of the resiliency built in. So as this is moving, it's moving towards stability, but don't forget, these systems are nested within larger systems. And if something changes in that larger system, it can destroy that stability. It can knock the system back to a much simpler level, at which point it will undergo this process again. So, you know, looking at this in shorter time frames over a period of, period of centuries, that's what ecological succession is. It's a self-organizing process where we get a disturbance, it leaves a site with relatively few species. Those species are generally generalist with big niches, but through time, as our, as I'll, let's say around here, our forests evolve, we'll see more and more late successional species being more and more specialized, and we're getting a lot of buildup of biodiversity, <coughs> almost all of it hidden, because it's down in the soil where the bulk of our biodiversity is. We're up in the canopy, and we get this myopic view. We go out and we say, wow, that doesn't look like there's many things out here. It's just hidden, because it's all underground or up in the canopy. But um, 
so succession is another process like this. It's moving from instability towards greater stability. But since our ecosystems are nested, we can get a windstorm that knocks it right back. Or we can get a logging operation or whatever else it brings back into other states. So it's more a trajectory of, of, of movement towards rather than an end result. Because you're right, everything changes. Yeah. Ultimately, they're operating in a closed system. Um, university, university closed. Oh, okay. Yes. It, it, well, there's some debate about that, but you know, <laughs> but yes. I mean, this in the universe. Yes, we're in a closed we're system. In that solar system. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and the universe as a whole system, it's sort of a one-way flow towards entropy. I mean, that's where we're going. We, we have no indication that's not going to be the case. Is every star? It's a concentrated source of energy, where that energy is diffusing out. Luckily, because of self-organization. On this planet, we're like a little eddy. We can capture that flow of energy from the sun, use it to self-organize, create these myriad of beautiful ecosystems. But you're right, in the long run, these will all fail. And in the long run, yes, our best explanation now is that eventually all the stars will burn out and the universe will just continue to expand and everything will just diffuse out spatially. So yes, that, that is true. Not this year, no, no, probably not this year. <laughs> not unless you're developing some really weird science fiction movie or something. <laughs> and then they somehow stop the process at the very end. But I, you know. um, I'm really happy with the discussion remaining in the, in the realm of things we observe and can postulate from. Um, because to me, the, the absence of something like entelechy or metaphysics in all this is what makes it so viable. That you don't have to work with absolutes and the terms are mutual. Mm -hmm. The terms are not value driven. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Alright, if there's no other questions, I would like to get us outside the field for maybe a half an hour to just look at some co involved interactions out there. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna meet outside the door. Yes. So have some Eurasian bittersweet. Um, it is again a introduced vine <laughs> from the old world. We can identify it. This is our only vine in the region that spirals up trees as it's growing. Um, now our native species of vines that climb on trees like um, Virginia creeper, poison ivy, have co-evolved with their trees to just stay on the trunk. They don't go in the canopy at all. Does that be counterproductive? If you go into the canopy of your host tree, and you cover it up and kill your host tree, it means you're not going to live as long. So whenever you can do it to benefit your host, benefits yourself. This is not a good strategy for the bittersweet. Because what it does is it climbs up a tree, gets up in the canopy, covers the canopy, and can kill the tree. I've seen areas in southern New England, up to 50 acres of forest, that are now just a, a rack of dead trunks in the ground and a mat of vine over them. The vine's up about this high. Now, this is a species that wants to climb because it can maximize solar gain in that way. So what does it have to climb on once it's killed off the forest trees that it grows on? Itself. itself. And so what it does, it starts twining around itself, fruiting and flowering dramatically go down. This is not a good strategy. It's not benefiting this species. It would be much better off if it did what our native vines did by staying on the trunk keeping their host alive longer, they would live longer, they'd reproduce more. So um, in time, I'd expect natural selection to kick into gear because this is a very energy inefficient thing to do and to force this vine to change its strategy so it doesn't kill its host tree. Um, and I am confident that that will happen. Now the problem is with all of our exotic species and stuff, we're talking about centuries to millennia for these things to start working themselves out. So in that shorter term period of centuries, we've got some serious, serious stuff to deal with. And we've got to be like Noah on Noah's Ark. We've got to ferry our current species through until these other ones can adjust and become responsible members of their community. Um, so that's, you know, that's our job. And, you know, we're never going to get rid of them. They are here. Once they get here, they are here. And since we don't have the human resources to get rid of them, we've got to start thinking like triage. So you know, where we have unusual ecosystems, we ought to really fight to keep invasives out of them. 
where we have rare and endangered species. We've got to fight to keep them out of there. And then after we do that, we apply our energies wherever else we can that seems fit. But obviously, some areas have to be let go. We just can't, you know, police everything. There's just not the human resource capacity to do that. Uh, but like I said, in the long term, I'm confident that all these things will work in. The last major influx of exotics we had in North America was three million years ago. That's when South America and North America finally joined up at the Isthmus of Panama. Um, and there was huge migrations of North American species into South America, South American species into North America. Uh, there was probably a lot of nasty stuff happening with all those young symbioses, but now all those species have incorporated themselves as functional members in our ecosystems because natural selection driven by energy efficiency caused them to co-evolve. And I'm confident the same thing will happen with all these. Now also, on this uh, maple right here, um, we can see some, some lichens. I can see you know a couple different species of lichen. Some uh, parmelia, which is this green leafy one here. There's some crustose lichens here, different species up here. We got quite a few different lichens on there. Now, lichens are a mutualism because they are a relationship of two individuals from different species. A species of Ascomycetes fungus and a species of algae or sometimes cyanobacteria. Um, now, the algae and the cyanobacteria can be free living. They can live on their own. They don't have to be incorporated in lichens. But the fungus can only exist if it interacts with its correct photobiont partner. And because of that, it's obligatory for the fungus, that makes this a mutualism. Both parties benefit, but the fungus has to be involved in order to survive. But the algae or cyanic bacteria benefits because now they can colonize all sorts of sites they couldn't colonize on their own. And it makes a much more robust population for them. So lichens are a great example of a mutualism. Now, how, what do you think the relationship is between lichen and tree? Obviously, the lichens are benefiting. They, they're getting something benefit to grow on the bark of the tree. What about the tree? Is the tree being harmed? Is it being benefited? Is it not being affected at all? What do you think hmm. is the nature of this symbiosis? This might be a step, and I don't have the answer, but I have seen um, just in walks in the woods that lichens grow in much greater profusion on dead um, or dying mm -hmm. animals. They do, and that's because the limiting factor for lichens is light. Mm -hmm. uh, that's their limiting factor. So right now, these lichens are in the cryptobiotic state. When their moisture levels drop down to about 8%, all of their enzymes uh, sort of fold up, and they cannot do any chemical reactions at all. So they're only active and doing anything when it's wet out. That's either foggy or rainy, and then light becomes optimum. So when you have dead branches, that means you have lots of light because there's no leaves shading those branches. So you will get more lichen growth on dead structures. But coming back to this living tree, how do you think it's being impacted? Benefited, harmed, not affected at all? Probably not, but you're on the right track. The tree actually benefits by having lichen on it. Not that it brings in more moisture, but it does bring in something else that's a benefit to the tree. What's that? Very close, yes. Um, nutrients and minerals. So lichens get most of their nutrients out of the air. They absorb it out of the air or what's dissolved in rainwater. So they can pick up calcium, potassium, phosphorus, all this stuff out of the air. So if you have a nice growth of lichen on a, on a tree, and let's say you get a very heavy rainfall that starts sheeting down that tree, a lot of that nutrient in lichen goes in a liquid soluble form and is taken right down to the roots of the tree as liquid fertilizer. Hmm. So trees benefit. Our, our oak trees, for example, have evolved barks that do not shed at all so they can get these robust coatings of lichen on them because they benefit from all that lichen growth by getting that extra energy nutrient. Studies have shown in the Pacific Northwest, 40% of the nutrients entering the soil in the Pacific Northwest come from lichens. Um, that are capturing that stuff out of the air. So they're really, really important. And a lot of trees have evolved barks to attract them and hold them. Now, some of our trees have evolved barks to not get lichens on them. And, and why would that be the case, do you think? Like our birches don't like lichens. Exactly, because our bark photosynthetic trees, they don't want their bark being covered by lichens because it reduces their photosynthesis. 
but on trees that once their bark gets too thick to be photosynthetic, then it becomes an advantage to become coated in lichen. So uh, a lot of what trees get heavy coatings. Of that What's that? The of, that of which kind of tree? A photos bark photosynthetic? Any bark that has really large visible lenticels, like cherries, birches, glossy buckthorn, buckthorn you got it, they're all bark photosynthetic. So, um, you know, if we had one right here, we just take a twig. If you just take a twig of any one of those species and you just scrape the outer bark off, you'll see it's bright green underneath. And of course, that expands the growing season uh, because they can do bark photosynthesis throughout the year. And actually, most of our trees that are bark photosynthesizers can do bark photosynthesis down to 21 degrees. So if any of these trees that are bark photosynthetic, their roots are not ice bound right now, they're doing photosynthesis um, miraculously. So it does very much elongate their growing season. Would lichen at all make <coughs> bark more susceptible to uh, sort of external parasites? Not they that I'm aware of. Um, you know, I, I'm not aware of them making them more susceptible because they're, they're growing on dead tissue. The bark is dead tissue and they're not really decomposing it or anything, they're just on it. It's just a substrate they sit on and again, get most of their nutrients out of the air. So I don't think they would bring in anything detrimental to the tree. And I should mention, um, within a lot of our leafy lichens like this, we have tardigrade communities. These are water bears, was a common name. They're microscopic um, invertebrates that look very much like bears. They have a roly-poly body, little stumpy legs, roly-poly head. Um, they're also cryptobiotic. So in these lichens, we have tardibares, tardigrades that right now are all sort of um, folded up because they've desiccated. Some of them are lichen eaters. Some of them are predators on other tardigrades that eat the lichen. So we actually have whole cryptobiotic communities here. So when it rains, all of a sudden, all these tardigrades flush up. The lichen eaters start eating the lichens. The predators start eating the tardigrades, eating the lichen. And then it dries out and everything just stops and may stop for who knows how long. In the next rain, all of a sudden, they all become active again, thinking, oh, gee, where was I? Oh, yeah, I'm eating. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> if we looked around carefully at all the trees and shrubs that are around us here, if you look really carefully, you'll see that there's a, a myriad of different branching patterns on trees, leaf shapes, growth forms. It's not all accidental. These are all specializations in how these organisms grow so they can coexist. If every tree had the exact same sort of uh, structural shape, twig formation, leaf formation, we couldn't support as many trees because what they're doing is they're specializing to divide up sort of the forest spatially so they can coexist. Uh, some of them have different tolerances for light, so some can live in very shaded conditions, others need more light, but they all have their varying niches um, and all are differentiated and specialized in some way that allow them to coexist. And that gives rise to much greater, again, repetition of function. But looking around, I can see a lot of white pine over there and over there. And even though we could go in those forests and we couldn't see it, by their presence, we know there's mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. Um, our coniferous species have so co-evolved with mycorrhizae, they cannot make it on their own. They have to interact with mycorrhizae. So what mycorrhizal fungi are, they're one of the four major functional roles of fungi. So we get decomposing fungi, that's one group. We can get parasitic fungi, that's a, a second group. We can get lichenizing fungi, that's a third group. And then we have our mycorrhizal fungi. And what mycorrhizae do is they associate with the roots of plants and extract carbohydrates from those plants. That's where they get their energy resource. But they're not parasites. In return, because of the extensive mycelium in the soil from that mycorrhizal fungus, they allow trees that associate with them to increase nutrient and water uptake over tenfold. And again, our, our, our conifers have so highly co-evolved with them, they can't make it on their own. They need to interact with mycorrhizae. Now, luckily, mycorrhizae around here are pretty egalitarian they'll interact with a whole group of plants. They don't have any one plant they're to interact with. So the mycorrhizae in there interacting with those pines may also be involved with oaks and birches and aspen and who knows what else. They, and what they do is they start linking everything in the forest together as a unit under the soil. 
Now, a study was done in 1997 that was quite a remarkable study. The intent of that study was to figure out how much energy mycorrhizae were taking from their host tree. So this, was, this study was done in the Pacific Northwest in a forest of Douglas fir and paper birch. So to do this, they inoculated Douglas fir trees with carbon dioxide, that carbon-14, that's a rare isotope of carbon, and they could then follow the movement of that. They'd know that carbon dioxide would get made into carbohydrates that would have carbon-14. And through this protocol, they figured out that the Douglas fir were paying out about 15% of their photosynthetic energy product to their mycorrhizal partner. And that's a pretty heavy payout. But if you need your mycorrhizae to survive, maybe not such a bad deal. So one of the grad students of that study said, you know, there are paper birds in this forest. We never treated with carbon-14 based CO2. I want to check those trees to see if there's any carbon-14 based carbohydrates within them. The lead researcher said, you're wasting your time. We didn't treat them. You're not going to find it. Well, sure enough, every single healthy tree that that grad student tested, just the way the lead researcher said, there were no carbon-14 carbon based carbohydrates within them. But every struggling paper birch he tested had carbon-14 based carbohydrates in them. In some cases, up to 6% of the energy in those trees had been manufactured by the surrounding Douglas fir. And what the guy realized was, holy cow, the mycorrhizae aren't just moving this energy in an indiscriminate way. They're pretty much taking from the rich and giving to the poor. <laughs> 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 and um, you know, from the standpoint of the mycorrhizae, that makes sense. The, the healthiest forest is probably going to be the healthiest sort of situation for them. So help the struggling ones, keep them going. And the, you know, the stronger ones can afford that little bit of loss of energy. But we now know that not only does energy move between our plants and forest ecosystems and other ecosystems, not just nutrients moving through, but now more recent studies are showing even information. Phytochemicals are being passed oh, wow. to alert plants of problems far away. And they start to get that information so they can start to adjust what's happening to prepare for maybe a munching, you know, sort of defoliation event or something. So the mycorrhizae are sort of like the original internet. <laughs> um, and it's one of the reasons that our systems are so resilient. And then this now explains a really puzzling fact. It used to be that when everyone just looked at, you know, competition sort of being the wherewithal, the idea was if you did a heavy logging and left seed trees, those seed trees should thrive because now you've removed all their competition. They have all that sunlight, all, those moist, all that moisture, all those nutrients from themselves, and often those seed trees would die, and that just didn't make sense to people. I couldn't understand why. What we know now is when you do a heavy cut like that, you just annihilate the mycorrhizal population and those trees were relying on it and they succumb because they don't have that resilient network they were a part of. Um, we are truly in our infancy of understanding how these ecosystems function. Uh, we really are just in our infancy. As we move through time, we're going to find more and more amazing interactions which are part of the resiliency of these systems. Um, because they are way too complex for us to even try to get a handle on, but we will learn more about them, but we should realize that we are in our infancy. and so. This brings up the idea that if you ever hear someone saying, uh, by logging, we can improve the health of the system. Mm. No, we can log, and I'm not against logging. I'm very in favor. I do on my property, but it's for certain desired outcomes. We're not going to improve the health of any system by intervening in it uh, because we don't completely understand these systems. And they've had millions and millions of years to co-evolve. We don't even know half even a small percentage of all those co-evolved interactions, so we have no idea what our interactions will do. Um, that said, we should not log. We should, but let's do it with uh, a clear idea of why we're doing it. We're doing it either to improve, you know, you know, standing timber for timber harvest, or maybe increase species richness, or do a lot of other things. But the idea we could ever improve the system is sort of crazy. These systems are fine on their own. They've had a lot of time to develop those strategies. So I think we'll probably have to end there um, because it's about seven minutes before, and I don't think we're going to see much new if we keep going down. But um, next week, we won't be out in the field. We'll just be inside. And then the last week, we'll really be focusing on applying this stuff into human systems. And uh, we will also go out in the field uh, then as well, hopefully to a place where we can actually see more. But I'll, I'll, I'll look around and hopefully, I don't know, the way it's going, we probably won't see anything, but the road berms will be up to there. <laughs> <laughs> but any questions before we head back to the, the library? Could you um, 
I hadn't heard before that the mycorrhizae around here work with both coniferous and deciduous trees. Mm -hmm. All of our mycorrhizae are in protocopper relationships. There's none that are host specific. So look at like Amanita muscaria. That you know the you know that that is a typical mycorrhizal fungi. It interacts with birch, aspen, oaks, conifers, um, plus a host of other tree species. So like I said, all of our mycorrhizae around here interact with a bulk of of different species. Sean, I, can you describe micro, mycorrhizae? Mycorrhizae again are just these fungi in the soil that whose interact with the roots of trees and that's where they get their carbohydrate that means energy all those from. Toadstools that come out, all, those micro all those toadstools that come out on mycorrhizal species, that's just like a, a sort of synonymous with the flower on a yep. flowering plant. Uh -huh. yeah. the, um, the mycelium in the ground is huge. Yeah. Matter of yeah. fact, uh, the biggest organism on... The mycelium on, is the root system. It's the a whole, this fungal yeah. thread system underground. Um, the biggest organism in the world is the humongous fungus in Montana. Fungus. It's a honey mushroom that covers 300 square miles. Wow. <laughs> yeah. All the same DNA? All the same individual, same DNA, same individual. Wow. Yeah, that's big. And in that 300 miles, it's linking everything together. <laughs> Can you eat it? Yes, that's why they're called honey. <laughs> they're sweet. <laughs>